y'all, it's Tammy with Real Southern Woman. I am ready to do a little bit of Bible study. I've been reading in Leviticus. We have graduated Exodus, and we're in, uh, moving into the book Leviticus. Now, I listened to quite a bit of this today, and let me just say this. Leviticus is mostly about sacrifices and offerings, and it's kind of... Um, complicated the way that it works so I'm going to just hit a couple of highlights the first thing I want to do is talk about what I wanted to read to y'all last night and didn't because it was actually past where I was in the Bible um, and that was how God had prepared the people to uh, make the tabernacle and the things in um, for the tabernacle, okay? And I just found it very interesting that God did have his hand on these people and he told Moses that he would. And I liked what he had to say. So I'm going to read that to you and then we're just going to talk a little bit about the book of Leviticus. It says, The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Ur, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. Now listen to this, y'all. It says, I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with the ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood to work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed with him Aholiab, the son of Asamuch, the tribe of Dan. And I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you, the tent of meeting and the ark of the testimony and the mercy seat. Isn't that something? So he lets him know that he is the one who gave these guys these men, these talents, so that the tabernacle could be built. It was a building that was made by hands of men, but God had given these men the ability to do it. Um, so I just think that's very interesting. I think it's very promising for us to know that God does have his hand um, on some people's lives, not everybody's life, but he does um, give some people a special ability. And hopefully, if he's given you an ability, you can use it for his glory. Now, in Leviticus, that's where we're going to graduate to next. We're going to move out of the tabernacle because we talked a good bit about it last night. And um, if you have any questions about it, you can always ask me. But we're going to move into Leviticus. Now, Leviticus is um, quite a hard reading type of book, okay? And when I say that, it's because it's mostly about the relationship with God and the people before they move into Canaan. It's a relationship with God being able to dwell near and around the people through the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, and these people being spiritually and in the right position to be able to commute or commune or even, you know, kind um, they've got to be made clean and pure and in order for God to dwell among them. Now, uh, this is what this is about. And this is all about sacrifices. Now, we know that when you think of sacrifice, we know that Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice. And we see sacrifices in uh, some of these crazy shows we watch on TV. We'll see uh, sacrifices in different parts of the world where people actually sacrifice another person. They'll actually sacrifice their children. 
they'll actually do all kind of things that are just, you know, crazy and out there. And they don't even have to be, in a, of course, in a Christian environment. It's just something that um, when you start reading the Bible, you will see that a lot of these different things that are done in the world comes from parts of the Bible. Um, there are ideas that have been around and passed down, and somehow these cultures and things have gotten wind of them some kind of way, um, and they're still used today. Now, when Christ died, of course, it ended the need for us to have to sacrifice um, in order to be pure, to be able to talk with God or be with God around God. Uh, of course, we're not around God like face to face. But let me just say, there are several, there's five different offerings in Leviticus. Okay. One is the burnt offering. Then there's a grain offering, peace offering, a sin offering, and a guilt offering. Okay, so in Leviticus, there's going to be five offerings that you're going to study and you're going to see the people have to sacrifice different types of things for these different offerings. And it was according to um, what was going on in their life and what was about to happen. Now, the burnt offering mostly was um, about praise. It was more of a thank like a thankful offering, okay? And sometimes it was done in addition to another offering, um, so it wasn't even separate from a different one. Then there was also a grain offering, which was supposed to be um, for a pleasing aroma for God. Then you have the peace offering, which is fellowship, like having a communion meal. And they'll even say... Um, it was a type of food. Um, I know from listening today that the burnt offering, of course, was uh, they could only use certain things. The grain offerings, they would have to use a fresh corn and, and grind it uh, with like first fruits. Uh, the first, you know, thing of the harvest. In other words, there was the sin offering when someone had actually committed a sin and um, had to be atoned of that sin. And then there's also the guilt offering, which was the same thing. Well, not the same thing, but when you've committed a sin and you're actually found guilty of something. Or you are um, aware of your guilt. It says that you become aware of your sin or your guilt. And then you would need atoning for. So then you would bring that offering to the tabernacle to the priests and his sons, and they would, you would offer the sacrifice to them, okay? There were different ways they did it. There were different animals that they did it with, different grains. There was cattle, sheep, goats, birds. Um, rams was the guilt offering, okay? So it was different. But the rest of them... Um, we're done with the other types of animals. The bull, I believe, was the what they call a ram, was the uh, guilt offering. Now, there were different, there was all different kinds of things about this. And if you go in and you start reading it, you're going to see that they could only burn certain parts of the animal. They could only eat certain parts of the animal. They would have to take the other parts of the animal that could not be burned or eaten and discard it. Um, so it was such a tedious, intricate, again, process that had a lot of different meanings and a lot of different purposes. But there's two things it says that we should really take out of this, or m two major things, and that is... There was, um, it was all about whether or not, it was all about the clean, cleanliness of your heart. And when they say 
in this um, that you had impurities or you were unclean. They're not talking about physically you stink. They're talking about your heart and how you are unclean on the inside. Okay? So, um, it said that... Uh, I wanted to read to y'all the two things it said that we needed to understand. Let me get to that. Okay. How ritual purity relates to moral purity. Okay. Because a lot of people, like chapters 1 through 16, are supposed to represent... Um, Like, I want to make sure I get this right. An ethical law versus a ritual law. The ritual law are chapters 1 through 16. The ethical law is chapters 17 through 27. But even if they are separate, they still kind of mean the same thing. Okay? So, the main thing you need to understand is unclean, clean, and holy are languages that are about the inside. They're not hygienic, okay? Another thing is this is a good explanation. I'm just going to read this to you so that so that you can understand this part of it. It says Leviticus sets forth three basic ritual states, the unclean, the clean, and the holy. On the one hand, these categories guide the community with reference to the types of actions a person may or may not engage in or the places that a person may or may not go. Those who are unclean, example, may partake of a peace offering. Oh, they may not partake of a peace offering. So if you're unclean, you would not partake in a peace offering. While those who are clean may. A, mo a modern analogy might be that uh, one of registering to vote. Like a person who is registered to vote may vote, whereas a person who is not registered to vote cannot vote. So it says there's a distinction made between the ritual states and the moral states. Uh, one who is in the ritual state of holiness is not necessarily more personally righteous than a person who is simply clean or unclean. So what they're trying to say is the ritual states are more like being registered to vote or not being registered to vote. Uh, you're not going to partake of this because of this. But moral things are different. And I know that's kind of deep and it's kind of... But if y'all start reading these... Um, they're all just going to kind of go together. Like, I was listening to it today, and you listen for a while, and you try to under, you know, you don't really try to understand. You just try to get a grasp of what these people are doing, okay? But after a while, it all just kind of seems like it sounds like the same thing over and over and over, in which, in a way, it was. It really was. Um, so... The main thing, I guess the key themes it says, is the Holy Lord is present in the midst of his people. And the people of Israel must therefore properly address their sin and impurity and must strive for personal holiness. Now, if it does anything for you at all, if you think, oh, I won't get anything out of that, if it could do anything for you at all, reading Leviticus should show you that we live in the age of grace, where we no longer have to do these things. And that is a blessing. Because, look, y'all, it used to be really, really complicated in order to get close to God or to be clean and unclean. And Christ really, really made a way for all of us for it to be much more simple because he did all the work. That's why when you look at Leviticus and you see all these things that people had to do, it's quite obvious 
that it is unobtainable through ourselves. Okay? There is nothing we can do for salvation. It's all what Jesus Christ did for us. Okay? So if you um, don't get anything else out of it, just look at it and read it and think, holy smokes, are you kidding me? Could, what these people had to go through in order to be clean or unclean was enormous. Okay? And it's here to show us that um, it's really a, unobtainable through us. So many people and so many different religions out there think if you do this or that, then you can get your salvation. You have to have this or you have to have that or you must do this or you must do that. But the problem with all of that is it's you, 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 or I, I, I. And you've got to get you out of it and you've got to get I out of it because the only person that can take you to heaven is Jesus Christ. Okay? So, um, I think that helps you when you look at this and see how hard it was to understand that it's Jesus' blood. It's that ultimate sacrifice. He wipes away the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, the peace offerings, the sin offerings, the guilt offerings. And he sacrifices his whole body. And he becomes all of these offerings in one thing. And now we have a way because of him. Uh, we were talking about the tabernacle last night. I'm going to end with reading a scripture in the gospel. And um, so if y'all want to read Leviticus, take some time and read it. Um, it's pretty much, you know, the same thing through. I will finish it up, and if there's anything else I think I need to review with y'all, I will. But for the most part, I've hit the highlights on the main points that it should point us to um, to help us understand just how precious of a sacrifice Jesus Christ was, okay? Uh, in case you didn't already know. So I'm going to go to, I believe it's in Luke. I know it's in, I believe it's in Matthew, and I believe it's in, I know it's not in John. So let me flip over here to where Jesus Christ is crucified. He is brought before the Pilate. Let's see. And he's, so it's before he's buried. Now listen, we know all about the tabernacle. We all know about the veil that was uh, separating the Holy of Holies. All right? So, the death of Jesus. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. While the sun's light faded. No, while the sun's light... I'm sorry, let's start over. It was now about the sixth hour... And there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw that what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for the spectacle, when they saw they had taken what had taken place, returned home, beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him to Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. So darkness, it became dark, okay? And there's reasons why it became dark. There's different reasons. One was the darkness of the world was laid on Jesus Christ. And so it became dark. Another was um, maybe God 
they say, you know, maybe it was just God um, showing darkness because this had to happen to his son for us. You know, it was a, it was a dark thing that had to take place, a hard thing. Um, but the veil was torn in that tabernacle. So when he took his last breath, the, the veil to the Holy of Holies was opened. That tabernacle was over. The, the need for the altar of incense and the sacrifices and all that was gone because Jesus Christ had finished his work just like he said. So it was just, uh, it's just a wonderful thing to hear, isn't it? Um, nothing more beautiful than that to me. I hope that y'all enjoyed tonight's Bible study. I hope that you get a chance to go into Leviticus and just read at least a few chapters in there so you can see what all these people had to do. It was, it's, it was unbelievable. Just building the temple, the clothes they had to wear, the, the strict rules they had to go by. I mean, it was they sprinkled blood here or they rubbed it on the horn, which was on the altar of incense, or they, um, I mean, it was just the list goes on and on and on and on and on. So only Jesus Christ could uh, get past that, all of that. Um, so let's just say our prayers, and it's good to see you guys tonight, and I'm happy that you've tuned in, and you want to hear about the Lord. Let's all remember each other in prayer. Let's remember our president, our country, our servicemen and women, um, and just everyone in general. Let's make sure we pray for our fellow Christians and friends as well. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today, and we thank you for this age of grace, we thank you for Jesus Christ's blood. We thank you for providing him so that we didn't have to continue with all of these sacrifices to be clean or unclean, Lord. We know that it's only through Jesus Christ that we can be clean. There's absolutely nothing that we can do. And we just thank you for providing that gift to us that way into uh, salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. Be with us as we go throughout tonight. I pray for those who are not feeling well and who are having um, hard times in their life right now with uh, stress or loneliness or sickness. I also praise for those who've gotten good news, for those who are doing well and feeling better than they normally do, we give you the glory for everything in our life, good and bad. And in Christ's name we pray, amen. I hope y'all have a very good night. Um, and I hope I've encouraged you some kind of way through the reading of the word. We will see you the next time. Probably next week since it's Thursday night. Because Friday nights we usually have a bunch of kids here. Um, me and Chris will be going to St. Mary's, too, this weekend. I'm trying to get my sister to go with us. We'll see. So, um, we'll talk to you soon. Bye. I love you.